lost Egyptian city inside the Grand Canyon? I'm David Wood, USA Today best-selling author of Classic Adventure for the Modern Reader, and today on Into the Unexplained, we are going to explore one of the most fascinating lost city legends in North America. Our story begins on April 5th, 1909, with an article in the Arizona Gazette. It began with the headline, Explorations in the Grand Canyon, Mysteries of the Immense Rich Cavern Being Brought to Light. The story tells of an explorer named G.E. Kincaid, who was traveling alone down the Colorado River in a wooden boat in search of what he called the mineral, by which he meant gold. Kincaid claimed to have observed stains on the sediment on the east wall of the canyon gorge. Curious, he beached his boat and made his way 2,000 feet up the side of the canyon to a shelf of rock where he discovered a cave entrance with signs of chisel marks. Inside, he discovered a myriad of hallways, rooms, mummies, copper objects, and various other artifacts along with what appeared to him to be hieroglyphics of an Egyptian or Oriental type. Now, it might seem odd to the modern viewer to hear Oriental used to describe Egypt, but back in this time period, the term Oriental was all-encompassing, and it would include everything from the Far East to India, over to the Middle East, and even as far north as Turkey. Kincaid carried a few artifacts back to Yuma, Arizona, and then sent them off to the Smithsonian Institution. The Smithsonian sent a team of explorers to the city under the supervision of a man named S.A. Jordan, who made a thorough exploration of the city. Only after the fact did Kincaid tell his story to the press. Here are some details of what he shared. Side passages branch off to the right and left, along which, on both sides, are a number of rooms about the size of ordinary living rooms. These are entered by oval-shaped doors and are ventilated by round air spaces through the walls into the passages. The passages are chiseled or hewn as straight as could be laid out by an engineer. The ceilings of many rooms converge to a center. Inside Kincaid found a shrine, and here is how he described it. Over a hundred feet from the entrance is the cross hall several hundred feet long, in which are found the idol or image of the people's god, sitting cross-legged with a lotus flower or lily in each hand. The cast of the face is oriental, and the carving of this cavern. The idol almost resembles Buddha, though scientists are not certain as to what religious worship it represents. Taking into consideration everything found thus far, it is possible that this worship most resembles the ancient people of Tibet. Surrounding this idol are smaller images, some very beautiful in form, others crooked-necked and distorted shapes, symbolic, probably, of good and evil. There are two large cactus with protruding arms, one on each side of the dais, on which the god squats. All of this is carved out of hard rock resembling marble. In the opposite corner of this cross hall were found tools of all description, made of copper. Among the other finds are vases or urns and cups of copper and gold made very artistic in design. The pottery work includes enameled ware and glazed vessels. Another passageway leads to granaries, such as are found in the Oriental temples. They contain seeds of various kinds. Now, I can't help but wonder where they intended on planting these seeds. They're 2,000 feet up a canyon wall, inside a cave, in the desert southwest. Kincaid went on to describe the hieroglyphics. On all the urns or walls over doorways and tablets of stone which were found by the image are the mysterious hieroglyphics, the key to which the Smithsonian Institute hopes yet to discover. The engravings on the tablets probably has something to do with the religion of the people. Similar hieroglyphics have been found in southern Arizona. Among the pictorial writings, only two animals are found. One is of a prehistoric type. Interestingly, in Arizona, there is a mountain range called the Hieroglyphic Mountains, as well as a Hieroglyphic Trail and a Hieroglyphic Canyon. They were so named because petroglyphs, which are common to the Southwest, have been found there. And apparently, people back then couldn't tell the difference between petroglyphs and hieroglyphs. 
After all, these are the same people who lump Egypt in with the Orient. Kincaid also found a crypt. The tomb or crypt in which the mummies were found is one of the largest chambers, the walls slanting back at an angle of about 35 degrees. On these are tiers of mummies, each one occupying a separate hewn shelf. At the head of each is a small bench on which is found copper cups and pieces of broken swords. Some of the mummies are covered with clay and all are wrapped in bark fabric. Among the discoveries, no bones of animals have been found. No skin, no clothing, no bedding. Many of the rooms are bare but for water vessels. What these people lived on is a problem, though it is presumed that they came south in the winter and farmed in the valleys going back north in the summer. One thing I have not spoken of may be of interest. There is one chamber of the passageway to which is not ventilated, and when we approached it, a deadly, snaky smell struck us. Our light would not penetrate the gloom, and until stronger ones are available, we will not know what the chamber contains. Some say snakes, but others boohoo this idea and think it may contain a deadly gas or chemicals used by the ancients. No sounds are heard, but it smells snaky just the same. The whole underground installation gives one of shaky nerves the creeps. The gloom is like a weight on one's shoulders, and our flashlights and candles only make the darkness blacker. Now you might be wondering, what is a snaky smell? Because snakes don't normally have a smell. Well, apparently, when a snake feels threatened, it emits a musk with a very bad stench. And apparently, when a copperhead is frightened, its musk smells like cucumbers, which I don't like because I love cucumbers, don't love copperheads. Now, this is a fascinating, if seemingly far-fetched story, but what sort of connections might there be? Well, for one, there are Egyptian place names within the canyon. The Tower of Set, the Tower of Ra, Horus Temple, Osiris Temple, Isis Temple. But, of course, to be fair, there is also place names like King Arthur Castle, Guinevere Castle, Lancelot Point, and Galahad Point, but nobody's looking for the Holy Grail inside the Grand Canyon. But could a cave containing artifacts remain undiscovered for centuries? The simple answer is yes. Grand Canyon is massive, a mile deep, 277 miles long, and 18 miles wide. The park, which doesn't include all of the canyon, encompasses 1,904 square miles in total. By comparison, Rhode Island is only 1,212 miles. And of course, there are plenty of caves in parts of Grand Canyon. Also, we know that, for example, the Anasazi cliff dwellings went undiscovered for many centuries because they're cut into the stone of the cliff and they can't be seen from above. And a cave entrance, like the one Kincaid describes, would be much, much smaller than a cliff dwelling. An example would be Stanton's Cave, which went undiscovered until it was excavated in 1954. Here in the Grand Canyon, archaeologists found a trove of artifacts, including more than 100 figurines, which were carbon dated to 4,000 years ago. And they also found a 15,000-year-old Teratorn skeleton, which is an ancient vulture species, larger even than California condors, also found several 20,000-year-old Harrington mountain goats and a 43,000-year-old driftwood stash likely left behind by the waters of an ancient canyon lake. Let's examine some theories about the lost city. The first one, obviously, is it's a hoax. No records exist in the Smithsonian's Department of Anthropology about Professor Jordan or Kincaid. There is not even a paper trail that gives details about this expedition. Kincaid offered no artifacts to support his tale, and the only source for this story is the single article in the Arizona Gazette. Something to remember is that this article was written in a time when sensationalistic articles were common. There were lots of crazy and unverified stories being published as news all across the western U.S. Stories included those of little people living in Mount Shasta, thunderbirds shot and killed in Texas and California, even a secret lizard society under Los Angeles. That one might be true. The second theory is one that you'll hear in just about any conspiracy theory circle, 
regarding just about any topic, and that is, it's a big cover-up. Some claim that scientists from the Smithsonian, supported by the United States government, covered up the find because the discovery ran counter to the accepted narrative of world history. The scientific community has a long interest of dismissing the possibility that sailors from a non-European civilization might have crossed the Atlantic or Pacific long before the quote-unquote discovery of the Americas. Conspiracy theorists also point to the fact that the park was visited by then-President Teddy Roosevelt in 1908. The canyon was subsequently made a national monument and then a national park, and many areas were declared off-limits and remain so to this day. Others still believe that elements of the Illuminati working within the Smithsonian and the government were actually the ones behind the cover-up. The next theory is one posited by Kincaid himself and is similar to ones that Graham Hancock has put forward, and that is that the cave was populated by an advanced ancient civilization. One theory is that the present Indian tribes found in Arizona are descendants of the serfs or slaves of the people who inhabited the cave. Undoubtedly, a good many thousands of years before the Christian era, people lived here, which reached a high stage of civilization. The chronology of human history is full of gaps. Now, notice that Kincaid does not suggest that the local native populations are descended from this advanced civilization. Instead, he says they're descended from the slaves of this advanced civilization. This reflects a pretty common attitude, especially at that time period. People who have a European bias tend to dismiss the achievements of races whom we consider inferior. For example, when the pyramids of Nubia were first discovered, the person who discovered them suggested that this dark-skinned race who lived right next to the Egyptians and actually conquered Egypt for a while were not possibly advanced enough to have built these pyramids by themselves. Instead, he suggested that someone must have helped them, guided them, or even done it for them. Even today, with many of the remarkable accomplishments of the ancients, we would rather give credit to aliens or to an advanced civilization. Puebloan tradition might also give us some insight into who these people were. The Puebloans have long believed that their ancestors once lived below ground and eventually emerged into our world in the Grand Canyon area. So perhaps this was not an Egyptian or Oriental city, but a dwelling place of the ancestral Puebloans. One of the first settlers of Arizona was a man named Seth Tanner, a pioneer and an explorer. Tanner allegedly stumbled across the cave long before Kincaid did, but he was caught by the Hopi, who typically killed anyone who trespassed in the cave. Because Tanner had always had a good relationship with the local native population and had two Hopi wives, they chose to blind him instead so that he couldn't find the canyon again, and they further threatened to cut out his tongue if he told anyone about his discovery. There are lots of fun and fascinating theories surrounding this legend. Unfortunately, there is no evidence whatsoever for this mysterious lost city inside a Grand Canyon cave, only a newspaper article. But if you would like to read a thriller centered around the legend of this cave, check out Anubis Key, a Jake Crowley adventure written by me and Alan Baxter. Thanks very much for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and we will see you next time.